2022 will go down in history as a year of growing deficiency, from reduced security and stability to energy deficiency, diminished trust in an EU institution plagued by a developing corruption scandal, an undeterred influx of illegal migration, all the way to staggering inflation. And while the so-called dark days of Christmas are upon us, a perfect metaphor to the darkness plaguing this European continent on multiple levels, now more than ever are citizens of respective European nation-states in need of a hint of a brighter future. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Hassan, and this is the 12th edition of TV7 Europa Stands. Joining me for today's panel include Dr. Rafael Bardachi, who is the CEO of Worldwide Strategy, who formerly served as the Spanish National Security Advisor. Thank you for having me. Colonel Richard Camp, a former British field commander and head of the International Counterterrorism Intelligence Team in the British Cabinet Office. Good to be here. Mr. Gert Wilders, who is a member of the House of Representatives of the Netherlands and chairman of the PVV party. Great to be here. And Professor Jacek Czaputowicz, who is a professor at the University of Warsaw, who served as Poland's Minister of Foreign Affairs between 2018 and 2020. Good to be here. I'd like to take this opportunity to give uh, each and every one of you an opening uh, point about what you regard as the most challenging aspect of this past year and the most challenging aspect that will linger also into the next. Dr. Barahi, we'll start with you. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we cannot forget that there is a war going on in Europe. Uh, and uh, what well, it seems to be a long war, at least for, from the Ukrainian perspective, and also too long for the soldiers from Russia that are dying there for no reason or without understanding Putin's motivation and even f without the will to fight sometimes. No? Uh, but beside this strategic uh, issue that we have talked uh, quite a bit on uh, our programs here, I think the last week put on the table a clear revelation about the European Union institutions. The Qatar Gate, uh, or the so-called Qatar Gate, involving the bribes of uh, almost 60, at least, European parliamentarians, I think it, it needs to be talked about for two reasons, at least. One. It's not only about the institution, which has been perverted in many of the original sense over the years and decades, <coughs> but also I think very importantly for the current challenges, because it affects basically uh, people from the left, the Socialist Party and other parties. And uh, I think we need to bring to the table that the left has no moral authority to tell us what to do, what to think and what to behave. No? In the last years, there has been a total cultural domination of the left on how the whole instruction or cohesion of the European Union should be for the future in an almost authoritarian way. And I think this has put very clearly to everyone that the left has no moral authority whatsoever. So I think it's very strategically important to, uh, to reflect on what's going on and what kind of corruption has permeated institutions and the left in Europe. Indeed. Colonel <coughs> I think the, um, the greatest challenge clearly that's faced Europe over the last year is, has been, they all alluded to, the war in Ukraine. And I believe that will be, continue to be the greatest challenge in the coming year and maybe years to come. But I think one thing that we should consider is the, 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 the bigger um, fallout of that war. And I'm talking about what happens to Russia. And I, I think it's inevitable depending on how the war develops. I think it's inevitable that Putin is going to fall at some stage. We don't know when. And when he does fall, will it be a clean fall and he'll be replaced by somebody better or worse? Or will it maybe lead to chaos within Russia and maybe violence, maybe break away of different parts of Russia, which I think is eminently possible. And we have also to look at the designs that China might have, for example, on Siberia, if Russia begins to break up in some way. So I think all of these things, if they materialize, maybe not next year, but perhaps a year after, whenever, I think will have enormous impact on, on Europe as a whole and the world. Very interesting indeed. Mr. Wilders? Well, um, I believe that one of the biggest problems for not only last year, but also the years before, is the bad representation of um, the people of Europe, uh, both domestically. We lack... Um, some exceptions, but mostly uh, strong and um, good leaders in Europe who um, are willing uh, uh, to tackle issues like immigration, illegal immigration, um, asylum seekers, the Islamization. Don't forget we are overcrowded with the Islamic ideology that has nothing to do with um, um, liberty um, or 
um, our own Judeo-Christian values that we share. But also when it comes to um, um, the energy crisis, the utility bills, the inflation and the price that people pay for their groceries, um, and there is lack of leadership, both domestically, as I said, most of the nations um, are um, not being led by strong leaders, and if they are, um, um, they are outcasted uh, by the European Union, which, as my uh, friend from Spain uh, said uh, very rightfully, um, are mm -hmm. totally corrupt uh, themselves, you know. They have, had, have been on the moral high ground to criticize um, leaders. So few of the leaders, like we still have, and for instance, in Hungary, um, Mr. Orban for the alleged um, 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 uh, corruption that they have. And now it proves that they themselves are the most corrupt of all, and especially in the social democratical um, um, party. So I believe um, to take back the leadership, and for me personally, I'm, my party is the biggest opposition party today, and the polls, we are the strongest today together with the party of the prime minister. We have elections in Holland in March uh, for the provincial, but they elect the Senate. It could turn out that we have new national elections when the outcome is bad for the coalition. And we try to take back the leadership um, as we are failing it uh, today. Indeed. Professor Djokovic? I agree with the opinions that the war in Ukraine is uh, the most challenging um, issue we face now, and it will be next year. Um, the challenge will be to maintain unity of the European Union uh, vis-à-vis -vis that war, uh, to maintain support of society and leadership uh, in continuation uh, of supporting um, Ukraine militarily. It will be also a challenge to um, maintain unity within the, um, the West, I would say, the, between the Europeans and the Americans. It is very important for countries like Poland because uh, the, most, um, the countries which support the most, uh, the Ukrainians, militarily, also financially, this is, of course, uh, the United States and the UK and countries of our, of our region, I mean, Eastern and Central Europe, like Poland, the Baltic states. Um, we'll see what, what will happen. I see some um, voices uh, just calling for kind of a peace solution, it will be premature to discuss this. We have to strengthen uh, also morally the Ukrainians to maintain, to, to continue the fight, and also, and also to provide them with weapons. So there is a danger. There is a danger with this, this keeping this strong position. And there are some voices of uh, saying that we should give um, security guarantee, not to Ukraine, but, by, but to Russia. It is unacceptable from our perspective. So to maintain that unity would be, would be a challenge. Fortunately, Europe managed to somehow uh, overcome that crisis dealing uh, with energy resources without importing gas from Russia. It looks like they will survive the, we will survive the, the winter. So it's a positive sign. I think next year will be, next winter will be much easier for the Europeans to, 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 to uh, stay without, without imports uh, from Russia. So this is a pos po positive signal, but of course there is also a public opinion, inflation, which is connected to that. Indeed. Well, there were three points that I think uh, are a common denominator. One, a lack of leadership, as uh, Mr. Wilders noted. The matter that Russia has been, or at least a war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, has been quite the most significant uh, uh, milestone, at least, uh, within uh, this previous or this current year still, uh, just a couple of days left. And then uh, the third angle is the transatlantic alliance. And if we look at those three points, Dr. Bardachi, you wrote a piece uh, which we spoke about already in uh, past uh, production. Uh, lack of leadership ultimately drew Russia to the offensive on Ukraine. Uh, speaking, of course, about the Biden administration, President Biden is not uh, regarded uh, as a strong leader. The United States was perceived as weak uh, under its current administration, which ultimately brought about uh, the various consequences. And, uh, you know, the lack of leadership in Europe, despite uh, the efforts, and, and Poland has been championing uh, a, a common European response uh, to the Russian issue. But uh, we see truly no leaders in Europe who really take the, the baton and uh, march ahead. What do you regard on this? Well, I don't have any explanation or logical explanation of the lack of political and strategic leadership in the Western world, or what it was called the Western world. No? But obviously, a strategy is something gone. No? Nobody is thinking beyond the next 
electoral cycle, no? And the next electoral cycle is not only four years, probably mid-term elections, local elections, so it's much shorter. And that, that probably ties up the politicians, even if they are willing to, to take some risk, to the immediate challenges and to the public opinion, uh, you know, how they, 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 they push the bottom in the, in, the, in the electoral day, you know. But uh, it is clear that without clear resolve and clear leadership, uh, we are lacking the main instruments to respond to the challenges, which are enormous. It's Russia, but it's China, it's the Islamization. I mean, uh, talking back again to the uh, World Championship of football, we have seen the, 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 the Moroccans in Paris in other cities acting in a way, let's say, uncivilized at least. Criminal. And, uh, and, and barbaric. So this has been also a class of civilization in, the, in this championship as well that we cannot put aside. No? There are challenges there, they are pressing, and, 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 and we are lacking the clear-minded polit politicians in our current governments, but also in America. No? We see the, a clear lack of interest in Europe, a clear lack of uh, perspective on the rest of the world by the Biden administration, and probably if Trump comes again to the stage, it will be even more more <coughs> distant between Europe and, and, and America. So the transatlantic link is really eroded nowadays, I think. So it's, it's, it's in a delicate situation where we are living now. No? At the same time, Putin is also weak. We went through the implosion of the Soviet Union, but the implosion of Russia could be something different. Just an interjection. Barbaric is German. Berber might be more correct in this situation. Uh, Colonel Kemp, uh, when we look at the situation, we just heard what Dr. Barakhi said, uh, Russia is also weak. To what degree does that impact the so-called Russian threat towards the entirety of Europe and, and the West as a whole? Well, I think, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that um, I, I, I'm not 100% I'm not certain that we're just seeing weak leadership. I think we're seeing misguided leadership as much as anything else. You know, there are some relatively strong political leaders, but they're, they're, they all seem in Europe, and they all seem to me to be going in pretty much the wrong direction. And often, I believe also, as we've been talking about EU corruption, um, we can talk about corruption in our national governments as well, and, and subversion of our national political leaders, who, who all seem to want to you know, even, for example, in Britain, the, the right is not the right, the right is the left. Um, and that, that applies, I think, to pretty much every government in Europe. And they're all following the same dog whistle towards the left and towards globalization. And I think that, that you know, that uh, often it's dressed up as something different, but it is problematic and it leads to situations, for example, I mean, you can look at some of the decisions that were made in, in the UK over China, even as recently as the period immediately before COVID, it was kind of corrected in COVID in a way, where, where completely irrational decisions were being taken about China, accommodating <coughs> China in a way that was hugely dangerous and everybody could see it, yet somehow it happened. Now, is that a result of some of this same corruption? I think um, as far as, uh, as, as the, the weakness of Russia is concerned, uh, I think it is, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think that is a big, a big concern for us as well. We don't want a Russia that's so strong that it, uh, it, it continues to try and dominate parts of Europe through force, as we've seen, um, which, of course, is encouraged by, and I, you know, I've said this before, I think we, the, the Put one of Putin's main reasons for going into Ukraine was Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, whether we should have been there or not is irrelevant. It showed on the part of the US and NATO, nothing but weakness. We've seen the same in Mali as Britain, France, Germany have withdrawn their forces in Mali. Again, whether they should have been there or not is another thing, but the withdrawal in the face of Russian aggression in Mali, that, that uh, shows weakness. So I think the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the biggest concern is, is not that um, Russia will lose, or Russia could lose the war, in Ukraine, which I think it could do, and it might not. Mm -hmm. But either way, um, it, the consequences of that are going to be phenomenal. Mr. Wilders, your take on this? Yeah, that, that's actually a lot of that um, is very true. But um, let's go back to the definition of leadership. And I believe that there is an explanation why we face, um, of course, there are, as I said, exceptions. But um, the majority of the European leaders are weak because 
they um, um, don't acknowledge the importance of a strong nation state. And I believe that every democracy needs a strong nation state, need national sovereignty, need uh, a cultural identity. People know, um, uh, have to know who they are and where they belong to. They need to be able to rally around a national flag. We need to be in charge um, of our own uh, budget, um, of our own lawmaking, of our own um, immigration policy. And all that is not the case anymore. We are not in charge on um, our own front door, who we allow into our nation state or not. We are not. Um, and we are in a kind of transfer union where we are not in charge of our own, of our own uh, money. Um, um, and the lawmaking process, I'm a lawmaker. More than half of the laws that uh, we have to enact upon uh, are coming from Brussels and not from the capitals anymore. Um, so I believe this is the problem. The definition in the European Union of good leadership is a leader, a prime minister, that has friends within the European um, Council of Ministers. I mean, that is the definition. Everybody was joking in the past about uh, President Trump who said America first. Well, I believe um, that would be the thing to do. Every nation should think about their own nation first. And if they can cooperate um, with other nations, we don't need a political union uh, because of that. You know, we started the European uh, Union in the, f in, the in the 50s. My country was one of the seven founders of the European Union. It was a, a economical cooperation without a political union. And this is what we should do. If we want strong leadership, we have to go back to the nation state and be in charge of the most important things that people believe in. Now we are governed by uh, unelected <coughs> officials like the European Commission or an institution like the European Parliament that is corrupt and nobody goes to vote for them and Holland 20, 25 percent. So take back national sovereignty, our own identity. If you don't know, um, who you are, you don't know who you are not either. So why um, are people getting so much immigration from Islamic countries? Uh, because the cultural relativists are in charge <coughs> and we should change that. This is the most important message I have. Professor Chaputovic, what, what we just hear is very different from what happens in your country. But your country and Poland is being, um, in my opinion, unabashedly uh, targeted because of it. Uh, from one part, most European uh, or EU member states are demanded to adhere to European Union law, but there is the uh, Polish clause where it says as long as it falls within the context of the European mandate. Um, what was that actually or how was that received by the European institution? Well, that's right. I think there are also other countries, uh, for example, Germany, when, uh, which have in constitution provision that that constitution uh, prevails over um, uh, European law if it is uh, not delegated uh, previously. The competences were not delegated in that sphere to the, at the European Union level. So uh, it's similar also. But the problem is that we are treated differently. There are double standards in in the European Union, Poland, uh, Hungary, other countries as newcomers uh, are, are treated not the same, uh, the same way. But let me also refer to the question of leadership uh, in relation to the war in Russia, because I think it is something more. I see that there is something in um, political culture in, in both countries, Germany and France, the leading one, in which Russia plays a special role. It's very difficult to change political culture. It is also, it is, uh, they are uh, social democrats and Christian democrats in Germany. They are, they understand Russia. For them, Russia plays important role in the future European security system. It is due to history, due to uh, uh, imagination of geopolitics, special role, and also to balance, uh, to a certain extent, the United States. So this is the main problem, how to change this culture. It, we will need more time. The, the, there is an attempt to do, to do that. But look at the um, Normandy format, so-called, to deal with Ukraine, to support Ukraine. Let me use the uh, phrase which was used to uh, use to, used to, to NATO. You, we can say that the format was established to keep Russians in, to keep Americans out and Ukrainians down, and to conduct business 
uh, above uh, other states, bilateral one with Russia. And it has made reason. So the policy was very wrong. Now it is recognized that it was very wrong. Uh, the problem is why it was so wrong, why, why they didn't listen to uh, voices from our country, from our region. And my answer is, yeah, it will take time to adapt, to change strategic culture, accept that Russia will not play decisive role in future. It's a challenge for, for all of us. Uh, Dr. Brada, he, since General Nauman couldn't make it this time around and defend Germany, among others, uh, I'll leave that role to you. <laughs> but uh, if uh, we can put I don't Everything think the is German government will agree with my <laughs> assessment. <laughs> Indeed. Well, um, I'd like to hear um, your position on this because yeah. I, I find this quite ironic where the European institution, which is quite actively um, trampling upon national sovereignty in, in any form where it may raise its uh, uh, head throughout uh, the European Union, is working adamantly to support the national aspirations of Ukraine, uh, which ultimately indicate, and this is what the Ukrainians say, we hear this across Europe, and, and ultimately we say this too, that without uh, the national will to defend your country, uh, nation states cannot exist. So to what degree is this paradox actually working? Well, I think that the paradox can be explained if we go back to the origin of the intervention by NATO and the European Union. I think the European Union entered in full force thanks to our foreign speak uh, spokesman uh, uh, because it showed the opportunity for the European Union to overpass NATO at the very beginning, who was doubtful. It was more a rivalry between the two institutions than dealing really with the, the Russian invasion at the time. Also, we thought in the very beginning that A, Ukraine will surrender in two days, it, it didn't happen then that Russia will crash in two weeks, it didn't happen either, and then we were caught by the Biden administration sending all the f in full force all the help to, to the Ukrainian government. No? But in the very beginning, I think it's the mistake, no? and then we are just tied up in the entangled in this issue and we don't know how to solve it any way out. No? Uh, but I, I would like to, to, to underline the importance of, the, yes, it's a contradiction of this sovereign, national sovereignty and as I, it is perceived in Brussels, no, which is t totally opposed to force to national sovereignty. Uh, we are now uh, undergoing in Spain, unfortunately, I have to say, uh, 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 the killing of Montesquieu by the government, uh, trying to impose th their control on the judiciary and, uh, system. And, and that was the accusation of the European Union against Poland. Um, because in the Poland was a conservative party, the European Union was in full force against it. Now, because the, in Madrid there is a social left, a social communist uh, government, the European Union says nothing. No? This is a double standard that is imposed by the European Union always, no? because it's a, such a social democrat leftist genetic inclination that I think uh, uh, we have a right at time we say enough, no? enough of this. Well, we'll uh, definitely ask for a response from uh High Representative Borrell, uh, who happened to be also a foreign minister of Spain, among others. Yeah. Um, Colonel Kemp, obviously you are enjoying this discussion as a Brexiteer. Uh, <laughs> could you elaborate a little bit on the, the English perspective to this? Because despite the fact that the United Kingdom left, or Britain left, uh, the European institution, it still is faced with many of the challenges pertaining uh, to the European continent. Yeah, I think it's. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've, I think you know we, we 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 wanted to get out of the EU so we could be our own masters above all. That was my perspective. So we had national sovereignty and we had democracy. We didn't rely on an unelected bureaucracy in Brussels, and that was the the primary reason for it. There were other reasons as well. Um, uh, and and frankly, we haven't really grasped it in my view. I think we've there've been various attempts, but the EU have also been trying to frustrate many of those attempts. They attempted, and maybe largely successfully, for example, to annex Northern Ireland to the EU, and it effectively is annexed to the EU now, and we're trying to get out of that and trying to change that situation. But it, it, that, that problem, which is resulting in potential uprise of violence again in Northern Ireland, um, this time more from the Protestant side as they, <coughs> they rebel against the annexation of, of, the, of the province, um, that, that's, you know, that's being held, I think, as a weapon for, for, against other movements 
away from the EU. <coughs> Many, most of our laws, as Hurt said, you know, the laws of Holland are made mostly, or a lot of them, in, in Brussels, and, and most of our laws remain from Brussels. We haven't really grasped the nettle of changing them yet, and there's a fear of doing so. And I think part of the reason for it is because the, the establishment, the elites within the UK, of all, in all political parties and in the civil service and most of the government uh, bodies uh, and quasi-government bodies are still pro-EU. They, they didn't want to get out. They still hope we can go back in. They're desperate to be as close as they can be. And for example, there's a lot of, a lot of movement from the Ministry of Defence and, and other areas to try and bring us into an EU defence union, even though we've left the EU, and that's very dangerous and worrying. So I think you know we're, we, 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 there was optimism when we left, but it, but the, the organisation has managed, I think, to maintain such a stranglehold, at least on the minds of our leaders, that it's it's proving very difficult. We'll soon start to discuss uh, the next topic, and that is the energy crisis in Europe. But I'd like to ask you, Mr. Wilders, uh, when we're looking at uh, the European Union's uh, imposition basically, on the Netherlands, when we're talking specifically also about uh, the, the Dutch Constitution, Article 90, Article 93, uh, pretty much giving international treaties more weight than uh, the local laws in the Netherlands. Uh, to what degree has this brought about what we're seeing today where the, um, all those woke agendas of, of uh, the uh, uh, renewable energies being forced upon um, natural resorts uh, all over the Netherlands. We're seeing farmers uh, basically fighting for, for their lives. Uh, about 3,000 farmers just in the near future are going to lose their livelihoods of, of hundreds if not more years in the Netherlands, those same territories. What, what is being done wrong and where can that be rectified? Well, <clears throat> it's as a matter of fact, it's a socialist left and liberal perspective that is more about their ideology than really what's the concern of the people living in the nation that kills almost every nation where they are in charge. You know, we are a country of farmers, of fishermen, and they are, um, for their environmental ideology, um, killing um, our farmers, um, buying them out, uh, wanting them to leave. Um, when it comes to other issues, like we spoke about before, immigration, we have indeed these articles in our constitution, and we are not the only ones that says that international treaties or um, European laws uh, are above our national constitution, which means that we are not allowed uh, to change and toughen up our immigration policy, which um, should have happened. And we have enormous problems with immigrants. Once again, not all immigrants are criminals, but they are overrepresentative in all the statistics of crime, of rape, of, of whatever you think about um, 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 in the Netherlands, and that should stop, and the people want to stop it. One of the reasons that the European Union um, um, lacks credibility uh, within the people of the Netherlands, and once again, all in, in many uh, nations um, in Europe, is that they are giving us, they are un we are unable to change the policies that we need. Uh, and maybe you allow me to say some word, um, words about Russia as well. Um, it, it's, it's clear to everybody, also to me and my party, that there is only one aggressor and that is Mr. Putin, who acts like a totalitarian criminal. But don't underestimate the amount of people in our nations, like the Netherlands, who are um, against uh, the policies of sanctions. Why? Not because they are against sanctions in general, because they know that sanctions towards Russia, sanctions have never stopped a war. Sanctions have never brought peace. If we, we sanctions the European Union, not the Netherlands, but the European Union as a whole sanctions Russia when it came to uh, became oil. Right? They said we don't want any oil anymore. The Russians, they sold the oil anyway to countries like China, like India, and maybe less, but for a higher price. So they have more profit even. They, we, we did not um, get uh, to the uh, raw machine of Putin. They were not hurt. You know who was hurt at the end of the day because the Russian, as a reaction, started to boycott gas from Europe? <coughs> Those are our own people. And if you are looking for ways to get more support, and, and I, of course I understand it, and I even applaud it, then this is not the way to go. Because if people are hurt with their utility bills, with the energy bills, with their, with their, with their grocery shops, and they know why that is the case, um, they will think about their own interests first. And that is not a social or wrong. This is the perspective of the most of the common people in Europe and in my country. 
And that should be taken into account. Professor Chaputovic? Uh, this is a way of thinking presented uh, uh, also within the European Union that the main threat to Europe is the Cold War in future and no relations, isolation of Russia. Uh, we don't agree with that. In Poland, we think the main threat for Europe is hot war, not cold war. And we have to stop, prevent that. So I read recently a very popular article by Chance Chancellor Scholz in uh, Foreign Affairs when he also referred to that issue and to, to the future. He is looking for peace. I think it's premature. We have to simply support Ukraine because the threat for us is the war uh, which can also expand. Cold War, we won Cold War during the Cold War, I mean in sure. history. We know how to do. The only thing we can... Um, uh, defeat Russia is to uh, isolate that, to impose uh, sanctions, yes. Even we pay with higher, so to say, cost of living. So it is maybe inevitable. So we have to be united in that policy. So there was a ninth round of sanctions against Russia. They are successful. Russian economy weakens. Now we have to also Im uh, impose a cap on uh, uh, oil uh, prices in order to uh, simply weaken this, 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 this economy because it is a threat for us. So we feel it a bit differently. The challenge for the world is simply a war and, not, 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 and we have to withstand this cost in society, at least in Poland. We um, just uh, accept many uh, Ukrainian refugees, mainly families, uh, women, they are in schools. Uh, this is a cost for society, sure. but we, we are ready to pay for that because the alternative would be much worse. Mr. Wilder, short response? Well, um, um, once again, I agree with the perspective, but not with the uh, policies. And of course, everybody wants to help the Ukraine, but let me tell you that there is a limit to that as well. Uh, the Dutch uh, State Secretary of Defense said and not so long ago in public in the Netherlands that if Holland would be in a war today, they would last for three days because we have no firepower anymore. We, we lack almost everything today. We don't even have tanks anymore. We are leasing 13 tanks uh, from Germany. We have, no, we have a lack of ammunition. We have nothing. And I believe that the more support you want to give, that at the end of the day, we should be able to defend ourselves. And we are not the only ones. There are also other nations, perhaps even the United Kingdom of Germany, who are at a limit on what they uh, can give. And the first priority should be, we should, of course, in NATO, help to strengthen the NATO borders. I mean, the Dutch military are active in Lithuania and Romania, and I'm very positive about that. But at the end of the day, we should be able to defend our own nation. So there are limits in what we can give and help to the Ukraine. Dr. Barraki? Also, I think uh, it's very easy for the current governments of any color in Europe to blame the war for the utility prices. But I think we, go, we need to go deeper. And the real name to be blamed for the situation today is Angela Merkel with the decision of going uh, and close down the nuclear power, with all the anti-nuclear mentality across the border in Europe. No? I think if we had taken different routes in energy policy in the past, we could put all the sanctions without having the, the negative consequences of that. No? So I think we need to rethink now how to be more independent ourselves, and how to uh, rethink all this uh, oversold uh, renewable energies that are unable and they are not co cost effective enough to produce enough energy for us and put the nuclear power station in perspective again because it's the only way out of the, the corner room in which we are on the s an energy security level. No? Colonel Kemp? I, I, when, when you talk about defending our own countries, I, I agree entirely. We, we don't even have the will to defend against illegal immigrants coming on boats across the English Channel. We don't even have that will. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, I really don't think NATO, any NATO member, maybe with the exception of the United States, possibly that's questionable, has any will to use military force against Russia directly, if it, even if it needed to. You don't know if it does or not. But I don't believe that even if Russia, let's say, took a bite out of Poland, I'm sure Poland would fight hard against it. I'm not sure how many Western European countries would physically come to the aid of Poland. I think there's so, we, we spoke about weak leadership or not before, and I, think, I don't think the leadership is strong enough to, for example, in Germany and France, probably even in Britain, to, to make that commitment of, of sending in 
uh, military forces to defend a, a NATO member, even though it's a treaty obligation to do so. And, and if Western European countries aren't prepared to do that, how the hell is America going to do it? So I think, you know, I think um, it's, it's one thing we don't even have the capability in many ways to defend our countries. And, and, and I really question whether there's the political will to do so. For the sake of goodwill, I just have to say this. General Nauman would be here right now. He would say you're wrong. He would say I'm wrong. And he said I'm wrong many times. And I'm sure he's right <laughs> to say I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I hope he's right. I, I'd like to hear Professor Czaputovic. Uh, does this sentiment also, is that felt in Poland? Is Poland, which has been far beyond uh, the, the point uh, where the Russians even invaded uh, Crimea and, and annexed that territory, you pretty much the only European nation which has stood up since the early 2000s and warned of such a scenario. No, that's right, because, okay, we just live in this part of Europe and we understand maybe Russian, the Russians better due to history. But I don't think that the Netherlands is threatened, I mean, by ag aggression from Russia, or neither Germany nor other countries. So you do not have to defend yourself because oh. you are safe and the politicians know about that. The problem is... At current stage, I think that they are even ready to say, okay, you are in Lithuania. The Germans are in Lithuania and Slovakia and recently to Poland with the uh, Patriot uh, batteries. But it is wrong signals to the Ukrainians because for the moment we are also safe. Russians are not prepared to attack uh, NATO member countries. The problem is that it could be a pretext not to support Ukraine because we cannot allow um, and accept annexation of part of the territory of sovereign state, which is Ukraine. So this is at stake. We have to maintain support for the Ukrainians. Even Polish government uh, told the Germans, please move this. Uh, batteries to Ukraine, it will be better used. They will be used there, uh, they need there. So, oh yes, and I also uh, agree with you, Colonel, uh, that, that, that it's not certain that n treaty obligations prevail in such a situation if there is a danger, if there is a po possible war. So the situation is very difficult. Uh, Ukrainians fight on our behalf, on the West we have, so we have to support them. It's, it's also the, the, the best way for us to defend our values. If they uh, are defeated, the problem will be for European Union, for, 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 for NATO and for all the world. European cohesion at this stage, uh, what Colonel Kemp just mentioned. Uh, Mr. Wilders, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. France and uh, uh, Italy were at loggerheads over the matter of migration. We saw the boats coming and uh, allegedly Italy redirected them in, in the direction of France. Uh, do you think that this is the new reality in which the moment we face a crisis, uh, this whole European construct is starting to fall apart? Yeah, um, definitely. And uh, it sound, might sound strange, but um, it should be um, like that. Every country should be in charge of its own interest, you know? We had all this, this, this European schemes about uh, the Dublin uh, arrangement and that every country, or if, if, for instance, all the um, asylum seekers that come to Holland can only 95% come by land. We only have two borders, which is uh, Germany and Belgium. And those are safe countries. So not one of them are actually asylum seekers, but they are, they are migrants, for they came from a country that is safe still. The Germans and the Belgians will not take them back because they say, well, sorry, uh, we don't have nothing to do with that. So at the end of the day, unfortunately, we have to protect ourselves. We have to be in charge of our own borders. We have to, um, once again, I'm very much in favor to, to reinstate Dutch border control with um, our military police and to get rid of, of uh, the Schengen um, Treaty, to make sure that we decide ourselves who is welcome in our nation and not. And if some person from, from either Syria, Afghanistan or Ethiopia or whatever country comes to our uh, border, for instance, the German-Dutch border, and he has no visa, and he says, I want to um, uh, have asylum in Holland, we say, come on, you're in Germany, it's a safe country, bye-bye, go away. This is what we should do, because we cannot afford to continue with the numbers that are coming to Holland today, mostly, by the way, men of uh, 20s and in their 30s, not, not, I mean, the women stay there and the men, the younger men come to, uh, come to our nations. We should stop it and we should do it um, unilaterally. It's the only way.
Of course, we're talking here about illegal migration. I think it's important to highlight that because ultimately uh, there is a legal way uh, to provide applications and then enter. And, and if they uh, add up all the, the um, categories that are necessary, they, they no, may... No, the, the, I'm sorry. What, maybe when it comes to normal migration, but not to asylum seekers. No, enough course. is enough. We, no. we cannot absorb more than we have today. A small country yeah. like Holland, we have more than 50,000 asylum seekers a year. I mean, they are sleeping outside. Uh, we, we, we cannot afford, we cannot even manage uh, to give them um, housing or food or whatever. So we, we should stop it. And the people are fed up with it. If you want to have more support for that kind of policy, you should stop it now immediately. Especially when it comes at the expense of the local communities, indeed. Uh, Dr. Barrejí, I'd like to refer this to you since uh, the majority of, of migration today to Europe is not necessarily anymore through the border from Turkey, but rather from the border of Spain. Unfortunately, most of uh, the Islamist migration, according to latest intelligence, uh, yeah. which uh, we've uh, seen, uh, enters from Africa, whether they come from Afghanistan or anywhere. They realize that uh, Greece has be, uh, toughened up uh, over the course of the past uh, couple of years. And w what's happening there? Well, I, th I think, first of all, we need to be conscious that there is a whole network of organizations and institutions devoted to playing with the lives of the people coming from Africa, for instance. No, I mean, some disguised as NGOs, but actually they are totally mafia of traffickers of human beings. And that has to be tackled and really corrected, because if not, it's impossible to, to eliminate the, or to put a, a halt on the uh, illegal, immig illegal immigration. Second, I think we need to enforce some border control. The European Union Frontex is a joke. And I think uh, nationally we need to go back and, and take full force control of the, of the borders. Because in Spain, for instance, we have three, in the, during the, this year, three different attempts of terrorist attacks that have come through people coming th with boats from Northern Africa, Algeria, or Morocco. So, yes, 99% are people who like to have the social benefit that the Europeans give to them for free. But there are some which are also with a bad intention of attacking us. No? And a lot of proportion that either don't, don't share our values and when there is a, a, a match, you know, they go uh, to do criminal and barbaric acts. So I think uh, we need to rethink the whole structure of this policy, immigration policy, which is uh, in the hands of the bureaucrats in Brussels, uh, which are forcing us to accept numbers that, as uh, Wilder said, are beyond what we can get uh, and accept anymore. I think uh, we are not forced to take more than we can care of uh, in, a, in a rational way, you know, and that's, uh, has, that point has been crossed already. Once again, Berber, not barbaric. Barbarics, I hear, are quite civilized these days. <laughs> Colonel Kemp? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have exactly the same problem in, in the UK. You know, they come from Spain and then <laughs> end up crossing the Channel and uh, entering Britain. And the, and the French will not um, cooperate with us in preventing this happening. Why not? I wonder why. It's interesting. Um, but they, the, the reality is, if you get off the beach in a small boat, the French are just going to, they're not going to make any attempt to put you back on. You're just going to go and come into one of these, uh, you know, whether it's a British lifeboat or a Coast Guard or, um, you know, or part of some organization within the network <coughs> that Rafael spoke about. But that's something that I'd like to focus on, actually. Yeah. The European Union funds many of those NGOs yeah. that help those same migrants enter the European Union illegally. Yeah. Yeah. How does that make any sense? It doesn't, but it needs to be, it does need to be, you know, it does need to be identified and dealt with. And, and it's not just the open NGOs, there's also underground networks that are involved in, in this whole operation, which Rafael alluded to, and that needs to be focused on by all of Europe, Europe's uh, intelligence and, and police and security agencies and dealt with, but you know, that's not going to end it, but it certainly could, a lot of work could be done on interdiction in that respect. But then you have the problem of, you know, getting rid of them. And we, we, we set up a scheme to send illegal immigrants to Rwanda, which that was, I think, six, eight months ago. Not one has gone because our courts won't allow it. And it, uh, to, to a large extent, it's, uh, it's down to, the, to our membership of the European Convention on Human Rights, which you know is preventing us as a country from doing what we, what our lawmakers decide that they want to do. So the obvious solution there is get out of it. Yeah. 
yeah. have our own equivalent of the European Convention on Human Rights if we if we choose to. But it's it's a it's a combination of um, I think. Uh, dealing with the smuggling networks, which can do severe damage to it, and then allowing yourself a legal framework which allows these people to be moved on. Australia managed it very successfully in relation to and illegal and immigration flowing in there. Let's, Mr. Wilders. Let's not forget, if I may add, um, the people and the ideology, ideology of the people that come to our nations. I mean, we're not talking about Canadians um, or Americans or Norwegians or Christians. We are talking about um, uh, people with an Islamic background, Muslims. And like I said, not all Muslims, uh, of course, are uh, bad or wrong people. But we had an institution, a university in Holland and in Germany, a leftish liberal institutions who made a survey uh, in the, among the one million uh, Muslims in Holland. And it proved that 70%, 70% of the Muslims in Holland said that if they could choose, they would choose Sharia law above um, our secular law. 10% of those people said that even um, if necessary, they were willing to use force and violence in the Netherlands, which is 100,000 people, which is twice the amount of the Dutch army. Now, I'm not saying that they will do that tomorrow, but the idea and the mind of, of, the, of the leftists and the liberals who believe that they could assimilate or, 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 or integrate in a society, I mean, sometimes it happens. Of course, luckily, there are very good examples, but often that does not work. So we are facing not only a problem of asylum and immigration, but it's an existential problem to the nature, the identity of our nations. So we should stop foremost and all the Islamic immigration to our nations. Indeed. It's a tough thing to say, but it's true. Professor Cebutovic, uh, we'll close this with you, this topic hybrid migration has been an issue that Poland managed to tackle quite effectively. And uh, ironically, the European Union was willing to back Poland on this matter, particularly because it came from Belarus and, and uh, the areas there and backed by Russia for that matter. To what degree is this still an ongoing issue? It is, it is. It is a part of the game, a strategy used by Russia just to encourage uh, migrants from Iraq, Syria, other countries to come now not to Minsk but to Moscow and they are transferred to the border with uh, Poland, Belarusian Polish border and they, some of them they cross and they are turned back by our uh, officers but some of them may, may go farther. So we, we are responsible for our border. At the time, a year ago, Angela Merkel wanted to have a deal with, with, with Vladimir Putin just to accept a couple of uh, thousands of migrants to stop that. It was wrong policy because he wanted for, he, he was going for that. So we were, uh, we had very decisive policy. We built a wall or a kind of a barrier at the border. We try to control because it's our responsibility. Uh, we are the country which have border with the, with the uh, external border of the European Union. But let me refer to what you just said. These migrants are 90% men. At the same time, we receive millions of refugees from Ukraine. They are 90% of women because men fight there and they are treated properly. So the, you have to look at reasons. You have to distinguish between r real refugees who escape because of the war in their country and they want to come back, first of all, if it's possible, and people who want to simply uh, move to Europe to live here to profit from social benefits. So this is an important distinction. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, and I'd like to get also an opportunity to hear your projections for the near future. Um, so put on the hat of a prophet for one moment. Um, Dr. Bardahi, we'll start with you. What, what is the main focus we should have for the upcoming year of 2023. Of course, we didn't even deliberate the matter of a nuclear-armed Iran. It continues to race in that direction. Is this something that we can expect to manifest in 2023? Well, I think, yes, of course, but I, I, let, me, let me take a longer view. No, I think uh, <coughs> the West is weak, not because of our external enemies. It's weak because of our domestic enemies. Exactly. Uh, starting from Ill illegal immigrants that uh, doesn't, doesn't respect our culture and our uses to this uh, sect of censorship that we have discovered last week thanks to Elon Musk in Twitter and in the social platforms. No? I think there is a woke mentality that is corroding really our essential values and if we don't take that seriously the Western civilization is doomed because our weaknesses 
I really want to bring us down. Uh, so we can talk about the nuclear bomb in Iran or the Chinese strategic challenge, but if we are not serious about what we are, our democratic values, our, the strength of our institution, our culture, our religions, our freedom of speech, uh, we are lost. And I think that that's what the woke mentality is really moving us to where uh, an informed destiny of uh, surrender. As we are in the days of Christmas, some silver lining? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, faith is uh, something for what you die for. Uh, ideology is something for you kill for. And I think uh, there are more people now on the, this woke mentality willing to kill than people willing to defend ourselves, unfortunately. Indeed, sacrifice is lacking these days, Colonel Camp. I, I, I agree with everything he said, because I always do agree with everything he says. <laughs> but um, uh, on your question about the Iranian nuclear threat, I think that's a, that is a real danger that's approaching. Um, I, you know, there's been a lot of effort by the Biden administration to return to the nuclear deal, the deeply flawed nuclear deal, I should say, um, mainly because it was something that Trump got out of rather than it being a good idea. But that was that was nevertheless something they were pursuing. I think European countries are also involved in that, have now recognized, uh, belatedly have recognized the danger that it presents. And I suspect, you know, given Iran's support to Russia, provision of um, drones and missiles to Russia, and given what's going on in the country at the moment with the, you know, the civil disorder, I think uh, that, that deal is probably not going to happen. But nevertheless, Iran is very, very close to um, probably capable now of having sufficient highly enriched uranium to make a number of nuclear bombs. What it doesn't have yet, and I think it's not likely to have for maybe a period of years, maybe one, two years, is the capability of weaponizing that uranium in order to be able to deliver a bomb. Um, but that will come. So that the, will the Russian-Iranian relationship is a concern? Yeah, it, it's mo most certainly a concern, including the potential for Russia to assist Iran with weaponization. Whether that's likely, I don't know. It's possible. But either way, it's something that, that will either need to be tackled or more likely will not be tackled and we'll be faced with a, 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 uh, a nuclear-armed or a theocratic dictatorship. Unless, I mean, there's one, there's, I've got one card up my sleeve, and that's Israel, who may decide to, to deal with it. Silver lining? No silver linings. <laughs> no silver linings. It's all doom and gloom, I'm afraid. I think, we, you know, the immigra illegal immigration... Very English of you. Yeah, yeah very, 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 the dark days of Christmas, as we call it. But the, the um, you know, illegal immigration will continue. The war in, Iraq, in Ukraine will continue. The, the, you know, the, the threat from China will, will build up, I think, even more. And so, yeah, the, I'm sorry I've got no, no good news on this level to offer, offer you. Fortunately so, yeah. Mr. Wilders. Well, indeed, Iran both has the capabilities uh, when it comes to the nuclear program, the means of delivery, and also the intentions. And so we should be very aware uh, and um, also look to our friends in uh, Israel uh, when they need and our support. But maybe my message is you know, I'm unfortunately, since 18 years, I got um, um, some Islamic fatwas against me from Al Qaeda, from ISIS, from Pakistani mullahs, from Iran. Congratulations. Um, and, um, and yes, I you know probably you do something too. right. No, but, but it learned, it learned, I learned one thing from that in 18 years losing my personal freedom. And that is that you should never give in. Never. And that's the lesson I believe uh, many more citizens in Europe. Um, um, uh, share uh, because they feel that um, they are not taken seriously uh, by their government because their, their, their problems they face with immigration, uh, with crime, with the utilities bill, with the groceries, with, with, with immigration, whatever you can think of, and they are fed up with it. And we saw the silver lining. My, maybe I'm the only one with the silver lining. We see some political changes in Europe. We see in Italy a new um, um, wave of politics. We saw it, of course, before in Poland. Uh, in Hungary, we see in Spain a party like Fox uh, getting stronger. We see results of, of patriotic parties um, in, the, in the parliament of France. Uh, we see uh, other parties, my party in Holland. So there is a way to be positive. The only thing people should do is at the end of the day never give in, not only to the mullahs, but also not to their own <coughs> national regime that don't take into account what their needs really are and get up and say they want change and vote accordingly. Professor Chepotovic? Yeah, when I think about Iran, it's possible that they may 
reach a stage of development that acquire a nuclear weapon, but um, yes, and it was maybe it was a mistake just to exit the JCPOA, this nuclear deal by uh, the Donald Trump administration. On the other hand, they are uh, uh, pundits who think that it will change policy of the country. Acquiring nuclear weapon m means that your policy is more responsible. Look at Pakistan, look at, look at uh, India, look even uh, at North Korea. Maybe uh, we should try to stop that. But for me, the problem is that there is an alliance between Russia and uh, Iran. Iran supports militarily Russia uh, and, of course, suffers Ukraine. When I look at the next year, I think that it would be not the worst scenario if the war continues uh, in Ukraine, Russian-Ukrainian war. The worst scenario would be if it finishes on the basis uh, uh, Moscow expects. Uh, so what we need next year, it is a strategic uh, patience, I would use that, that name. So simply we have to wait because in the long run the West is stronger. Uh, it's democratic, it may develop better weapon. So we do not have to rush, we should not have to rush to have a kind of a quick uh, peace agreement and then to come back to the business as usual. This is the main danger, but I believe it's, we can just simply influence the situation and uh, the positive scenario might happen, which is the end of the war somewhere in future. Uh, on the um, uh, how uh, you, the Ukrainians want to finish it. Silver lining? Uh, so it is, it is optimism about the um, advantage of the Western democracy uh, over the um, authoritarian regimes and it will win, I, I think. Indeed. Well, I, I'd like one last sentence from you, Dr. Baradaki, regarding uh, the European Union's institution, corruption will get exposed ultimately? Well, it took 70 years to dismantle the Soviet Union apparatus. I hope that we are reaching that stage of the <laughs> European Union at one point. It will collapse with the help of people which are patriotic or civilizational or whatever you want to call it. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Barraji, Colonel Kemp, Mr. Wilders, and Professor Chaputovic for your being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank all of our viewers at home as well. And uh, once again, Merry Christmas from all of us here to you. And uh, a Happy New Year. Until next time, good evening. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.